Ladies and gentlemen, and well, actually, I think it's all ladies, friends and colleagues. My name is Nikki Loney from Full Voice Music. Welcome to our second Full Voice Office Hours. And today we have uh, not only a very important topic that uh, is something that's important and uh, uh, often something that's a challenge in our teaching studios, which is working with adolescent voices, uh, but we also have an incredible guest. It is my absolute honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Ginevra Williams. Now, if you have not yet absorbed. This is mine. You can see my book, Teaching Singing to Children and Young Adults, is literally falling apart. Pages have been dropping out of it. It's bookmarked. It is, I sleep with it beside my head sometimes at night just to absorb all of the good information. Um, Dr. Williams, uh, her research spans decades. And this this book changed the way I approach teaching uh, my young singers. And this is such amazing work. And we have a very special announcement about this book at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ginevra. And, um, and then we'll get dive right into all these amazing questions. So a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for being here today with us all the way from the UK. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. That was such a lovely welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm up absolutely amazed by the number of questions, the quality of questions and the variety. Gosh, how are we going to get through it all? <laughs> <laughs> that, well, we'll have to I, do another one. <laughs> we'll have to do another one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, so... First of all, I do want to thank everybody for submitting your questions. It really does help. And uh, Ginevra and I were talking about this prior to beginning. There's some really beautiful questions in that we got. And I think it speaks to how much care and concern and how much we want to support and honor our students as they go through um, you know, adolescence. And I think we can all agree that going through adolescence is not a fun time. I don't think I would want to go back to that. Anybody here, raise your hands if you would like to go back and be a teenager again. No. Ginevra's like, I had some fun. <laughs> 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 and and as a mom who has a 13 year old let me tell you <laughs> um i want to start Ginevra. i want to ask you uh because this is asked and it's asked a lot and i think it is a valuable question there let's so let's debunk some of those myths some of us and i remember hearing this when i first started teaching is it necessary to discontinue working with your students when they're going through voice change? Do they need to rest their voices? Are we going to do great harm if we are working with changing voices? Let's address that first. Um, I'll be quick. The harm is actually really difficult to do. <laughs> um, emotional harm, uh, learning bad habits, um, setting people up with negative expectations and all those sort of harms can really happen. But actual physical harm to the voice is, is really, really difficult to do uh, and very unlikely. So if you're going to rest your voice because it's changing, you've got to stop speaking and you've got to stop laughing and you've got to stop coughing and you've got to stop all of those things because those are all using your voice far more than singing. And obviously that's nonsense. Obviously. Um, and actually, on a serious note, if you have to do complete voice rest, if you've had a, an operation on your larynx, for example, you might have to do three days of total silence. All right. That's, that's a serious thing. And there's a reason for that. Uh, but actually, the rest of the time, we use our voices and they benefit from being used. Singing is absolutely crucial because of the social uh, benefits, the, the cultural cohesion that we get, the feeling of group, the identity, all of those things. These kids are listening to music all the time. They're listening to singers. They have these role models out there. That, you know, they want to be that person. They want to sing like that person. It's really important that they do it, that they sing. They need to. Oh. Right, that's the end of that rant. 
<laughs> uh, thank you. For, thank you for that. I, I agree. You gave me goosebumps. And uh, now following on that, I think one of the questions that we got a lot of is how do we help our singers who are just so uncomfortable? I mean, they you often have a singer that doesn't like the sound of their voice as they're exploring different sounds or, you know, maybe it's maybe it's more about identity of growing up and how how what's the best what are best practices for teachers to help support students as they're going through these changes as their voices are doing things new and they're creating new sounds what's the best way we can support them it's a really uh, important question actually because teenage times adolescence is when we are finding our identity then when working out what kind of an adult we're going to be who we are who we want to be like, what our tribe is, what we believe in, what music tastes we have, what kind of clothes we want to wear. There's so many things about identity. There's some exploration going on. Uh, there's a lot of, of trial and error. Um, and it's, in, it's really important for the adults who are around those teenagers to allow them to do this, to enable this, because this finding your own identity is uh, discovering autonomy. It's learning how to be an adult. And it's a messy process, all right, because the brain is developing at different rates. So the emotional bit kicks in before the rational bit. And, and that's a bit messy at times. And that's what leads to people doing daft things and, and maybe risk taking, maybe making decisions that aren't as clever as they could be. But then those kids need to be held during that time and allowed to do it. So with this whole concept of, of developing identity and the fact that it isn't, it is not a linear process, it doesn't go smoothly and cleanly. It's a bit bumpy. What can we do for their singing while they're developing this, this identity? Um, we can make sure that we don't challenge them unnecessarily. So don't make things difficult for the sake of it. All right. Mm -hmm. There's time ahead for difficult technical practice. There's time ahead for things for very complex songs that have got, you know, lots of fast notes, lots of riffs, big range difficult pitch jumps, whatever it is, if they are challenging, when somebody is vulnerable, it may not be the time for a big challenge. If you can help those singers to feel really proud of what they do and really comfortable in the repertoire that they have chosen and really happy to sing those songs, then there, that will all feed into this sort of positive affirmation of who they are. And when kid, these kids are feeling more st strong and more confident, they're beginning to like the sound of their own voice, then you can then you can lift them up and take them on. So number one is don't don't give them massive challenges at this stage, not big pitch range, not not the really difficult shouty stuff. Just keep it comfortable. Um, one of my key philosophies for teaching is find out what's easy and make it easier. Because if you make easy easier, then that grows and that will gradually eclipse the difficult stuff. Don't look at the problem and jump in to deal with the problem. Look at what's easy. So this, this is the number one thing. In order to do this, in order to help them nurture their identity, you need to know what it is. You need to know who they want to be. So you have to have a conversation. Who do you listen to? What kind of music do you like? What would you like to sound like? What, what kind of, of singers do you, do you listen to? Who would you go and see if they came and did a gig in your town? Those sort of questions. Uh, and you may be surprised by the answers because sometimes kids are into odd things, quite unusual things. It may not be the, the sort of number one singers of, of the moment. So ask them, ask them what they listen to and what they like. And then you can start to 
negotiate and say, right, great, well, that song's going to be quite tricky, but we can do the beginning bit of it. We could rewrite that bit. We could make that bit a bit easier. Let's do that and bring that down a bit or bring it up a bit. Or, you know, you can make your own adjustments. But you've got to ask them what they like. If you get the sense that they don't like the sound of their own voice, then have a conversation about it. It's no, don't dismiss it and say, oh, but it's not a problem. I like the sound of your voice. It's great. Because, um, you know, it's a shame that you're feeling like that about your voice. Uh, what, are there times when you do like your voice? Are there times when you feel more confident about it? See if you can find a way in. Uh, if somebody doesn't like the, the sound of their voice in the upper range, um, maybe you could uh, introduce them to some other singers who have a different sound in their upper range or who make the most of having that slightly lighter sound. Just go, go in gently, starting on their level. Start with what they bring to you. And if they don't bring anything, if they're just silent and a bit sullen, You've got to find a way in. Find something you can talk about, even if it's just their pet cat. <laughs> yeah, just there will be something. There'll be some common ground. I love There'll that. be something they can talk about. What colour jeans do they like to wear? You know, those kind of questions. I love, I love how in our pedagogy we've really moved away from the teacher-led and now embracing student-led and how powerful it is. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, sometimes it's really challenging and you feel, you feel all this pressure to want to fix things. But I love the, com I love those conversations are so amazing, you know, when they finally do feel safe in your space and they can share things with you and you can make those connections. I certainly appreciate my young singers. They have introduced me to some fabulous music that I would have never discovered on my own. And I'm always grateful and I always take the time to celebrate it, whether it's my preference or not. I, like, I think, I think that goes in line with like supporting them is like, I really like the way he sang that second verse, <laughs> right? Like there's always some connection we can make. Yeah. Yeah. I want to move because these are always big questions. I want to move into um, there's often the questions of what are the best? You know where I'm going with this, Ginevra. What are the best technical exercises to assist? How let's maybe could, let's start with um, testosterone led changes so because there was a, a lot of questions about boys and as the voice starts to change do we work on the high register do we let the high register go but what are some of your go-to or how would you help teachers to discover the exercises that are most effective hmm i'm not a huge fan of exercises to be honest <laughs> <laughs> i didn't a whole bunch of teachers that. just went what what <laughs> <laughs> Continue, please. There's the old saying of, you know, what's the best exercise for? You know, and it could be managing your registered changes or what's the best exercise for lower back pain? What's the best exercise for, you know, and the best exercise is the one they'll do. Okay. That's, that's the first answer. Yeah. Find something they like that, that is fun, that works. All right. Uh, an exercise has to have a reason. It has to have a function. It has to have something that then applies to the song. It's not like taking medicine, you know, do six of these every day and your voice will improve. Right? That's, that doesn't work like that. So there, there has to be a, a reason for doing it. Now, the kid doesn't need to know the reason at the time. And sometimes it's good not to. Sometimes I would just say, could you try this? And we might do a silly noise, or we might do a little slide up and down, and we might do it with a hand gesture or a you know a body movement or something, and it changes something, and then they that learning of the change that has happened is what's important, not their um, rational cognitive understanding of what's happened. It's the body learning the different sensation. So if you can find something that makes it a little bit easier, 
like transitioning across a register change or like um i mean there was a we're talking uh about testosterone changes so this is where the voice gets lower in pitch and the range gets smaller and the there's a sometimes quite a, a awkward clunky transition up into falsetto that may or may not be there sometimes the falsetto just isn't comfortable goes away so the ways to bridge those those um, clunky uh, what do you call it? <laughs> I'm glad this is being recorded. <laughs> changes that'll do. Those clunky changes. Um, it's probably just to go more gently through them. So just sliding gently, sliding from up above and down, sliding from below and up and see how much you can unite the two. But you need to do it gently because as soon as you apply pressure and try and do it loudly or strongly, then it's probably going to crack, more likely to crack. Cracking is just instability in the system. It's when you're working too hard and, and then things crack because the, the muscles don't get that tight and stiff and can't adapt. And then the system just, just goes, goes a bit chaotic. <clears throat> so find a gentle way. So I haven't given you any exercise at all. You've got to work out the exercise. You're clever, imaginative people. Your students are clever, imaginative people. Exercises will happen. Yeah, you can just slide around and an exercise will be there. Or you can jump up and down or you can do little onsets, little starts, little stops, little slides, and you can try different vowels. You can, there are all sorts of ways in and around. Um, but I'm not going to prescribe exercises. Um, someone has just messaged a, a question, and it was also on the list. Uh, would you recommend SOVTs for the SAGE group? Uh, the the SOVTs are never going to do any harm. The only time they are not useful is if you've got weakness, inherent weakness in the voice. So if you're working with paresis or paralysis, or you're working with an aging voice, or you're working with something that needs to be strengthened. Okay. Um, but in a normal healthy voice, SOVTs, this is just exercises where you've got um, a valve at the front. So either fricatives or, or brrr, lip trills or, or rrr, tongue trills or, or or into straws, any kind of occlusion at the front. Okay. Um, it's never going to do any harm. It's not going to help the breathy upper register, particularly, but it'll help to reduce the effort and the hyperadduction in the overworked lower register which may be contributing to the breathiness in the upper register. So in, in a way, it's just going to help even things out. Yeah. So if you want to strengthen one part that is a bit weaker, take the pressure off the strong part of the voice with the SOVTs, and then it's more likely to transition more easily through the register change. And then you do the opposite. Then you take the low one as loud and hard as you can up the top and see what that feels like and, and observe the whole thing just going exploding <laughs> or imploding as you cross that bridge. And then you go, well, that was fun. Let's try it a different way. Oh, I love that. I think, I think for me, when I was working with uh, my primarily young boys in my studio, it was always the, I, I knew that exploration was, was valuable, but it's the, it's the worry that you're not being productive or it's, it's the worry that, you know, you're not, it's not going to be helping them. And it, and I think I learned over time that it's important to be patient. What, what you do one week and try it again the next week. And it's not, it's not, there's no prescriptive fix, but it's hard as a teacher because you want to be productive. You want to see progress, but this is such a, such a, a challenging time in their development. 
Progress is one new thing per lesson. Oh, good reminder. One new thing, one thing that they can do when they leave your room that they couldn't do when they came in. Oh, that. And it doesn't need to be big. Just a new sensation or something that works a little bit more easily or just some more of the song learned or whatever that is, but one new thing per lesson. Brilliant. I, uh, I Staying with um, uh, testosterone-led changes, falsetto. So, and again, I love what you said at the beginning about the, our students have to be comfortable, but um, when we have... When we have the students that are used to singing high and they really want to stay up there, but it's getting harder and harder and harder for them, um, what are some what are some strategies for just getting them to? Or is there a guideline for when they should or should not be using a different part of their register? There is there is a guideline, um, and. By and large, it's pretty reliable. And those are the Cooksey stages, John Cooksey stages, um, which I, and I can um, point you towards a link for those at the right. end. Um, there are, any rule is there to be broken, okay? So there may be exceptions, but they're pretty, they're a pretty good guide, actually. I would very rarely, if I strayed away from them and it would only be for a couple of months. Mm. Um, so the, the first thing to do is to listen to the speaking voice, because that's going to tell you all about where that voice is most comfortable. So listen to the speaking voice, listen to the average pitch of the speaking voice. Now, this is really easy now because you can get an app on your phone that'll do it. You can get an app that will record the speaking voice and churn out an average fundamental frequency for you. In the old days, you had to do it by listening and being a bit more clever and then sitting there banging on the on the keyboard. Jennifer says, what is the app? I'm that the, look, Jennifer, apps change all the time. <laughs> New things come out every month. Just look at frequency analyzer or how to assess my speaking pitch. Uh, because the ones I was recommending a year ago have been superseded now. There are many, many. Um, and then the, just talk to the, the uh, kid about it. Say, you know, this is measuring your speaking voice. Your speaking voice is, is giving us all the information we need about what stage of voice change you're in. And as your speaking voice drops, so maybe, you know, if it's the G below middle C, the average pitch, well, that's going to be in stage two. So that means that you're probably going to find the alto range most comfortable. You might be able to sing tenor, but you're somewhere in between alto and tenor. Speaking voice goes down to maybe an E flat below middle C. Aha, now you're in stage three. So that's definitely tenor range, um, but you can't necessarily sing all the notes that an adult tenor would be able to sing. So you're not going to be able to get the really high notes. You're not going to be able to get the really low notes. So those are the sort of conversations and you have the conversations with the kid so that they are then assessing their speaking voice, knowing what to expect. Then it's not a nasty surprise. Then it's all it's to do with preparation, isn't it? Nobody likes nasty surprises. They like to be prepared. They like to know what's going to happen next. So and the thing about when your body is changing, it's full of surprises and you may not be aware of what is going on with your friends' bodies. You may be ahead of the pack. You may not have all that information, or you may have been presented it in, in a sort of textbook, but you, you don't know what it's going to feel like. So preparing them as much as possible for what is going to happen to their voice as they go through adolescence. And you can tie this in, you can link this in with the growth of their body. You can watch them getting taller, you can watch their feet getting bigger, you can make all of those connections. So um, you can have the journey with them. And then they will come in and say, I think my voice is now moved down to here and, and this, this is going on and say, great, let's find some songs that fit that. Or maybe you need to go and think about singing a different part in choir at school. 
all of those conversations. Just keep having the conversations. It's nothing, there are no secrets. There's nothing awkward about it. And don't, it's not a good idea to keep singing high in, in a testosterone led voice change. Um, even if you've got a really good high soprano range, once your voice is going down to stage three, you, it's really not going to be useful. When I say damage, it's not going to damage, but you're just going to learn all sorts of, of habits that aren't helpful in the longer term. It's a bit like walking around playing football in a pair of football boots that are a size too small. It's really not going to help your feet. And after a while, your football skills are going to suffer because you're not going to be able to run properly. So just make it comfortable. That's a great analogy. Uh, if we can, let's move into estrogen led uh, changes. And one specific question is, uh, I would like to better understand uh, the mutational chink in developing female voices and how to best help uh, students navigate from that perspective. Yeah, this is a thing that is talked about a lot. We know what it sounds like. Nobody really knows why it's a thing for this particular, you know, like a two year, two year period. Um, it's probably to do with growth and stability. So when things grow, they become less stable. All right. So as muscles grow, as as uh, bodies grow, you know, structures, bones, bones lead the growth, bones grow, then the cartilages grow, then the muscles have to keep up because otherwise they wouldn't, it, they'd become unconnected. Um, muscles have to keep up, but as they grow to keep up, they grow in length before strength. So when anything goes through any kind of growth, it's going to be less coordinated. You're going to sacrifice some of the coordination, strength, um, facility, that ease of use. And in the um, voices, estrogen led change, you've got this, there is growth of the larynx and it's a different type of growth from the testosterone growth. Um, the larynx, the, the thyroid cartilage just stays rounded at the front it doesn't go into that sort of pointy bit it stays rounded um but it is growing and there may be a slight imbalance from the back to the front there may be an imbalance of the tiny muscles that attach to the arytenoid cartilages this is just theory we don't know for definite but that causes this instability in the system and means that they are less able to close for the entire length of the vocal folds they manage it in the lower pitches. It's much easier in lower pitches. Um, and because as you go higher, as the cricothyroid contracts and the vocal folds lengthen, what happens naturally is that they pull apart at the back. As they get longer and thinner, they pull apart at the back. So the higher you go, the more breathy the sound. That's what happens. Unless you learn skills to close that gap at the back. There's always going to be a gap at the back in the female. Anyway, adult female, there will be a gap, uh, especially in the higher pitches, but we don't hear it. If we don't hear things, they're not a problem, okay? There's no point <laughs> in, in poking something or looking at it with a camera and saying, oh dear, that's a problem. If it sounds all right and it feels all right, it's all right, okay? It's not a problem. So this slight escape of air, most of the time we get away with it. Sometimes it sounds a little bit breathy. Um, and there are exercises we can do. There are exercises for this. <laughs> Closure exercises. So working on very light glottal onsets. E, e, ooh, ah, just closing as you start the sound and then you're more likely to get the full length of the vocal folds closed. My favorite way of working with, with closure on the uh, full length of the vocal folds is to play with silly noises. 
So making different emotional noises. And you might find somebody who, when they sing, they go, ah, as breathy as anything. And then when they see their friend coming towards them in the street, they go, oh, <laughs> and you've got the most gorgeous clear closure in the upper register. So play with those sounds, play with different emotions, play with role play, play with just anything that will work. And those, I think those are much more fun, inventive and memorable ways in than lots of exercises. I that I love that. I feel so validated because I've been telling people to, with children's voices to do play-based sounds and and now it just applies to everybody. I love it. <laughs> I do a lot of play-based sounds with adults of all ages and it works very well. There are people who find it uncomfortable, all right? You will find certain uh certainly certain autistic people find it quite uncomfortable. Um you know, don't expect everybody to find play fun. Some people won't get it. And that's a question of, of knowing your, your student and knowing what, how they work and what they need and what make, what's going to help them. I want to uh, circle back. Jennifer had a follow-up question, and I think this is an important question because it, I think it happens to a lot of voice teachers. So, um, uh, I have a 15 year old boy at a prestigious art school right now. His choir teacher keeps having him sing extremely high at a very loud volume and he's a clear baritone approaching almost bass. Um, he's really suffering through choir because of this and I'm not sure how to advise and what my place is here. This comes up all the time for teachers. How do we advocate or how do we get our students to advocate for themselves? Oh, well, it's very, it's different in different situations. Um, firstly, um, you don't want to set up any kind of difficult situation between the student and their teacher at school. You all need to work on this together. All right. There's no, there's no benefit in saying, yo, your teacher doesn't know what he's talking about. You should be doing this, you know, um, because that kids don't understand that, you know, the teachers up there, you're up there. Why should you be disagreeing with each other? All right, so that's find a way for everybody to talk about this. So talk to the student and say, the reason your choir director wants you to do this is because you're so good at this, because you're so valuable, because you're doing really well, because you're leading. Um, why don't you go and have a conversation with them? Have a conversation with the parents, if you can. Bring them on board and just explain. Don't the, the choral director may just not understand that this kid, he might not have spoken to the boy for a while and may not know that his speaking voice has gone down. Um, the, the choir director is, is hearing somebody who's got a very strong sound and is a good leader, thinks that he's doing everyone a favour. So don't assume the worst. Try and go in and have a, a pleasant conversation. If you need evidence to back it up. Um, I've got a heap of stuff on my website. If you go to my website, which is um, www.ginevrawilliams.com and there's a resources page, it's called Ginevra's Knowledge Centre. You sign up for it, but it's free to get in there. And if you go in there, there's information, there's Q&A stuff for the the student to have. There's um, just useful information for teachers to have. There are also copies of several academic papers that I've published in journals uh, with the research that backs this up. And you can get those, normally they're behind a paywall, but you can download them for free from my website. So those, you've got three levels of information the academic papers may be a bit, you know, they've, they've got a lot of words in them, but they basically are the only published evidence about this. Okay, this is science. So 
you can't, you shouldn't argue with the science. People will argue with the science. They always do. But because um, <laughs> they come with their own confirmation bias and their own insecurities and all of those things. But if you try and be kind about it and non-threatening, don't go and hit him over the head with academic papers because he won't love you for it. But I'm sure you can be very clever and find a way around where everybody ends up happy ever after. I have a, that was wonderful. I have a follow-up question that follows into that vein. And it was the, uh, several people asked this question is, what is the most helpful information you can provide parents uh, of a boy or a girl whose voice is transitioning? How do we get parents in, um, to understand that this is a changing time and how we best support our, our students? Yeah, people don't think about voices changing often. They see the changes, the visible changes in the body. Um, I really smell the changes in the body. <laughs> um, they see the changes in behavior. Uh, you know, the door slamming and the you don't understand me and all of this stuff. Um, but the changes to the voice may not be so obvious. And this is where you as a teacher need to keep the conversation going with the parent as well as with the student or with the student there. You know, so no secrets, you know, nothing, nothing done under, 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 um, under wraps. Um, keep that conversation going. Keep um, sending follow up emails, little voice notes. If the parent comes to pick the, the kid up, get them into the room, have a little chat about it. Just normalize it. So there are, again, no surprises. Say, this is what's happening at the moment. This is what may happen in the future. It may not, but just let's just be ready. And it'll open up all of these amazing possibilities and potential for this kind of repertoire, this kind of behavior, these kind of songs. You know, it is, it is opening the doors on new experiences. Going through voice change is not shutting doors, it's opening doors. That is so helpful. Um, Michelle has a question about working with a voice that demonstrates injury. Um, uh, I'll just read it here. Uh, sometimes neurodiverse students have yelled a lot or been dysregulated over early childhood, and you can hear huskiness and speaking voice as a baseline. Is this something you can remedy, or do you work with it within those constraints? Um, first thing is, I would get an expert opinion on that. Um, if you think that there is huskiness in the voice that never goes away, um, it, it is, I think, important to go to a doctor and get that looked at. Get a, a consultant, laryngologist to have a look. Um, because that those problems, if they've been there for a long time, they may not just disappear. They may just be, they, they may stay put, in which case that's going to reduce that kid's ability to make themselves heard. Uh, it's going to mean that any kind of, of projected voices will be a struggle. It will affect their identity. It will affect the way that they perceive themselves in their group. If they've got a husky voice that is not as expressive, that isn't as, as hasn't got the full range that everyone else's voice has, it is limiting. So it's not, I, you don't need to just live with it and put up with it. I would suggest going to get an expert opinion. If they've been for to a laryngologist and there's nothing visibly wrong, but they've just got a husky voice, then you can start to work with it and you can do all sorts of flexibility work and maybe find a speech therapist locally who you can work alongside to work on, on getting more clarity in the voice. I, I'm glad, I'm really glad you addressed that because I think, again, sometimes parents don't recognize that a voice teacher is not a medical professional and we do not have, that is out of our wheelhouse. So they might not understand, and I've always found that, is that they didn't understand the role of a speech 
you know, an SLP versus an, like an otolaryngologist or, or, you know, like, and sometimes having that conversation is like, yeah, this is outside of my wheelhouse and I have to refer out is, is it can be awkward, but I think it's important. Yeah, it is. It is important for that kid's development. Well, um, I, I want to, um, I'm so excited. I have a couple of, we want to do a draw. We're going to wrap things up. I want to thank everybody who came today. And I have a couple of very exciting announcements before we do the draw. So first and foremost, um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So uh, I am so to the moon excited to tell everybody that uh, Full Voice Music will be publishing Geneva's third edition of Teaching Singing to Children and Young Adults. And um, Geneva, I'm going to let you tell a little bit about the new book, what's in it. You've collaborated with some incredible people. So I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little moment just to tell everybody a little bit about it. Okay, this is so exciting. This has been a project that's almost two years in the making. Um, the new edition of the book, this has got a lot more stuff in it because I have eight collaborating authors who've come in to help me with, with specific parts of the book. And this is where I think it's, it's wonderful to know your community and to know who's out there with what levels of expertise. And I've got Alex Aitken has written three fantastic sections on musicianship training, all very imaginative, very um, student led. You don't mention music theory. You learn it all by embodying it, by listening to it, by having fun with it. Um, there are, as a chapter, a new chapter on performance anxiety, confidence and identity, co-written with Amelia Carr. Um, there's a new chapter on the learning and feeling brain, co-written with Heidi Moss Erickson. So these are all these are just amazing people in their own right who have come in to help me write my book, which is very nice. Um, I've had John Nix help me with the acoustics and voice performance, the science chapter. I've had um, Liz Jackson Hearns has helped me to get my approach right and my language right in a more inclusive way of writing about teenage voices. Um, she really held me to account actually, Liz. She's, she's a tough lady and really, really wonderful, <laughs> wonderful person. Um, I've had Stephen King help me with writing a section on safe, creating a safer space. So that's not just safeguarding, but it's just acknowledging the person in the room uh, he's a psychotherapist and just thinking about the language that you're using. Very useful information. Uh, who have I forgotten? Frith Tresavant, who's written um, a section on repertoire, how to be, again, inventive with repertoire, rather than saying, that's not appropriate for you now. <laughs> let's, it's a way of saying, let's find a way for it to work for you now. So there's a lot, I think the big shift is much more student-led and much less rules-based. Uh, yeah, the older I get, the more rebellious I get. There we go. <laughs> well, we're we're so excited and we've been working with Geneva over the last year to finalize this and we've just been able to announce it recently. So we're so excited. Now, I do want to, uh, I want to have some fun with everybody who is here. So um, in the chat, Mim is going to put a Google link. This is to register for a seat at Ginevra's upcoming presentation, Voice Growth and Change in Kids and Teens. This is a two-hour presentation. It dives deep, deep, deep into uh, voice growth and change from infancy all the way through. She talks about testosterone-led changes, estrogen-led changes, and what students can and can't do at the certain, in the, in the developmental stages. And it is fun. It is a hands-on, you have to participate, fun presentation. So if you go to the link that Mim has put in the chat, it's a, Google, it now. Okay, it's a Google form. 
Uh, it's a Google form. Just put your name in there. And then what Mim is going to do is she's going to put it on one of those uh, wheel of names. And we're going to have a draw for two seats. Yes. So the name that you write will be visible on the screen. So write whatever name you want people to see. um so i i we we did this uh we did this presentation back in november and it sold out it was a packed zoom room and so many great questions and, and really great feedback from from teachers and just a great presentation and uh i just wanted to uh i i just wanted to let teachers know that if you cannot attend this time, I know how busy everybody is. If this time is not convenient, all of our workshops offer a 21 day replay window. So you're sent a link and in your own time, when you get a second, when you can carve out some time, the the uh, workshop is there for you to take advantage of. So that allows us to um, that allows us to be more inclusive to teachers whose time zones aren't ours. So please make sure is are all the names coming in there, Mim? Uh, pretty close. I have 14 and I know we have 17, 16 participants. So I think that everybody has put a name in. Now on what one of our guests, Amanda, you have two people in your video there. So I'm not, I just don't know what to do. I will just enter the second person's name. Okay. That's what I'll do. I can enter it manually. So can you just type in the name in our, in our zoom chat of the, of who your friend is there beside you, assuming that your friend wants to be entered into the draw. <laughs> cool. Like, and I, I will manually type in her name. <laughs> okay. Is it, is it time to, uh, to grab I'll, the info? I yeah, think I'll, uh, I'll let you share. Uh, have you got it in the, have you got it in the wheel of names? Um, I have entered them. Okay. Yes. Can I screen share? Yeah, Woo! Here we go. Is so da, da, da. Okay. So everyone, please. Roll. Take a look, and uh, I haven't entered that one additional name yet into the chat. Oh, great. I see, Amanda, it allowed you to do two forms. Cool. Okay, nobody else do two forms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so does everyone see their name on there? Please alert me through the chat if uh, if your name is not there. Give everyone a sec to do that. Okay. It looks like we're working. I'm gonna spin the wheel. However, <laughs> I forgot to turn on my sound. Give me one sec, because we need the sound. I think we're ready. Here we go. Office hours are so much fun. Erin, <laughs> <laughs> yay! Okay, so congratulations, Erin. Woo! I'm going to remove you from our second draw, but we'll get your information and send you all the stuff you need. Okay, moving on. Here we go again. Are you ready? Woo! <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Joyce, Joyce and Aaron, I've got your email. I've got your email uh, with the registration. I'm going to send you the link and I'm going to add you to the list now. But wait, there's more friends. I have lots of fun things to show you. And for those of you who did not win a prize, I uh, for coming today, if you would like, please, there's a $20 off coupon for the presentation. If you use office hours, this expires on the 18th. So if you're gonna take advantage of it, please do it this weekend. Um, and just FYI, this office hours also applies to our upcoming workshop on play-based learning engagement and lesson pacing. And if you are interested in small group classes, I have one coming up uh, this month. The $20 will apply to each and any and all <laughs> of our workshops. Now, I do want to just say uh, a big thank you to everyone. 
and especially to Dr. Ginevra Williams. Ginevra, thank you so much. Such a great, great information. Um, I want to let everybody know that our next office hours is actually all about full voice resources, how to leverage them, how to get the most out of them, how do they work together with, with other resources, what ages are most appropriate, and uh, that's going to be later in April. We haven't chosen the date uh, yet. Um, oh, Michelle asked, when will the new book be published? That's a great question. We're hoping for summer. Um, but you know, these things take time. If we can get it out sooner, great, but, but probably summer 2024. So, uh, that's, that's our goal. So, but, um, if, yeah, Ginevra's like, please. <laughs> so, um, for our next live office hours, friends, um, we're going to be talking about the full voice resources how they work together, how to best use them, how, and we're actually going to dive into some of the research and development so people kind of understand where we're coming from when we set them up. So if you are interested in that, you're already on my mailing list, so I will send that out. And as always, our office hours has lots of fun and prizes, so you don't want to miss it. You could win some new books or some new downloads for that. And I am, oh, Jennifer asked, can we pre-order the book? Yes, you can pre-order the book, but we'll do that closer to the release date, usually about six weeks prior. Basically, when the book kind of goes into print, then we can start to take pre-orders. But yes, we'll let everybody know. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so my friends, my goodness, it's Friday. Ah, oh, I hope. You are going into a beautiful weekend wherever you are. And that I'm wish, as always, I'm wishing everybody inspired teaching and happy singing. And a special thank you to Geneva for today's presentation. Yay! Thank you very much, Nikki and Mim, for doing this. And thank you all for coming. Have a great afternoon, everyone.